This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Previously, we spent a lot of time undoing things and taking this painting apart, removing the lining, the adhesive, the surface grime, the old varnish, the retouching, and getting it to this state. And the painting doesn't look great right now, but that's because we're not finished. The hard part is ahead of us, putting it back together. And honestly, putting things back together is often the most difficult part of any project. But with Squarespace, putting your website back together, even if you've taken it apart, really isn't that difficult at all. You see, Squarespace is built on a modular platform that allows you to add and remove, change and customize just about every part of the website with a click of a button. That means if you want to change the colors, or add a gallery, or add an e-commerce solution, you can do it. It's easy. No code required. And so whether you're going to use one of their readily available templates for your website or customize one from the ground up, or you're going to start off with a simple landing page and then evolve it into a comprehensive website to sell your products, Squarespace is capable. And if by chance you lose the manual after you've taken it apart, Squarespace has thought of that too, with online tutorials, guides, and a robust forum to help you along the way. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash baumgartner to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Last time, we did a lot of work, cleaning the painting, removing the old lining, doing several hot table treatments, all to get the painting ready for this treatment, the interleafed lining. And I chose to do an interleaf with a rigid piece of PET film in between the painting and the new lining canvas because the painting had significant tears, the canvas was heavily deteriorated, and I just didn't trust that a regular soft lining would provide enough support. And this lining begins by preparing all of the materials. The PET film gets coated with an adhesive, as does the canvas. And in this case, I added a layer of flat spun nylon gossamer to the back of this canvas. And it's going to help the interface between the very smooth PET film and the textured canvas so that we have a good bond throughout, not just at the high points of the canvas. I'm going to trim off the excess of this nylon gossamer and then begin trimming the PET film down to size. I need it to be slightly smaller than the stretcher because it won't bend like canvas and if it's larger than the stretcher it'll be impossible to stretch the painting to the stretcher. Once it's all cut down to size I can begin assembling the sandwich. The PET film goes on the back of the painting, and the painting goes onto the new canvas, where I have previously adhered a sheet of adhesive film. The corners are ironed down just a little bit to make sure it doesn't slip and the registration goes off, and then the painting is transferred to the hot table, where the lining process can begin. Cotton webbing is wrapped around the perimeter, through bag extractors are placed on the cotton, a piece of film is taped down to the painting, the air is extracted, the heat is turned on, the table is cooled, the painting is removed, the lining is complete. And now the painting can be married to the new custom-built stretcher. This painting is slightly irregular. The canvas was cut not square, so there are areas that are not perfectly aligned with this stretcher, but this painting is going to get a frame and the rabbit of the frame will cover up any raw canvas from the lining. Now you might ask, why am I using a stretcher instead of a strainer when the piece has been interleafed with a lining and really can't move all that much? Well, for two reasons. One, there's really not much more cost to using a proper stretcher as opposed to a strainer. It's negligible in the grand scheme of things. It also does add a little bit of tension, which can help the whole painting stay flat. Even though this does have an interleaf, it still can sag, and we don't want that. And if ever this painting needs to be removed from the interleaf and somebody else decides to not line the painting or do a soft lining, well, this stretcher can be reused, so it's future-proof. Once the painting has been tacked down and all of the excess canvas trimmed off, I will deal with the excess on the back. 
A lighter weight tack than the ones used to affix the canvas to the stretcher are used to fold over and secure this extra canvas in place. It has no purpose, it doesn't provide any real structural benefit, but it looks good and I like the way it keeps everything clean and tidy. And that matters when I'm doing a massive conservation like this one. Matters too for me is how the corners, which really nobody's ever going to see, are taken care of. And so I fold them in and tuck them under because that means that they're less likely to fray and come undone during handling or as it goes in and out of the frame. Now because this is a stretcher, I do need to put the keys in. And yes, I am going to tap this out to add a little bit extra tension on this support. The keys will also help keep this stretcher from distorting or moving because now these joints are locked in and tight. Now once that's all complete, I'll bind these keys in place with some tacks and fishing line. And I'm not concerned about the fishing line deteriorating over time because it's really UV light that causes this fishing line to break down, and the back of the canvas will see almost no UV light, if any at all. Once married to the stretcher, I can now begin the process of filling in all the losses. Now one thing that may be clear is that I didn't go to extreme lengths to remove all of the old fill-in. Sometimes I do, and sometimes I have to, but in this case, it's good. And if it's good, there's no reason to subject the painting to extra work, my client to extra cost, and me to extra headache. <laughs> so I'm going to reuse a lot of, if not all, of that old fill-in. Now, you can see I still had to go over it and fill in lots and lots of little gaps and voids. And because there are so many, I'm not going to turn to just using little swabs. I'm taking a piece of wool felt and dipping it into a little bit of water, straining off the water, and then using the felt to rub over the surface and remove all of this excess material. I saw a master plasterer do this on skim-coated walls to get rid of the textural buildup where he didn't want it, and I thought to myself, why can't I do that on paintings? The slightly damp wool picks up the excess material where it's standing proud of the voids, but it doesn't pick up too much. It's not like a sponge. It doesn't conform to the texture of the painting, so it really does work. But right now, the painting is not ready for retouching. I need to put on an isolation layer, or in this case, a saturation layer, or whatever we want to call it. This layer is going to perform multiple things. It's going to let me see the painting as it will be when it's finally varnished, which allows me to match my colors more accurately. Also, because it's more viscous, or thicker than the regular varnish I use, it is going to fill in some of those micro divots that I wasn't able to catch with the fill-in material. Sometimes that fill-in medium just doesn't fill in and stick if there's too little of it. So in some of those tiny little cracks, this layer of resin will fill in and smooth them out better than the fill-in material. This is fully reversible and archival, so it can be removed in the future, but because it's composed of a different resin than the one used in the retouching paints, the retouching, which is going to sit on top of this, can be removed while this layer preserved, if ever needs to be done. And you can see just how much the painting changes, how much more full of life and color it is once this layer is applied. Up until this point, though the work I've had to do on this painting has been involved, detail-oriented, and time-consuming, it has not been particularly challenging. It's basically run-of-the-mill for any conservator. But that's all about to change with the retouching. Because the amount of time, the amount of mental, emotional, and yes, physical capital that's going to be spent putting this painting back together, well, it's enough to run a cup over. Well, it's enough to run a thick cup over. Because of the style of this painting, the retouching is much more difficult. If this were an abstract painting or an impressionist painting, it may take a lot of time, but it would be relatively easy. But because this painting was so finely created, because the color transitions are so smooth and without border, it's really challenging. 
Not to mention, there's just so much retouching to do. And the retouching paints that I use are not particularly well suited to actual painting. They dry really quickly. When you go over them, they reconstitute and lift up. You can't really blend them. And they can change as they dry. So for all of these reasons, retouching this is complicated. And so I've started on an area that is, well, both really consequential, really difficult, and actually kind of easy. The skin, because it has a high degree of white and is very opaque, is much easier to retouch, at least for me, than some of these glazed-in brown-black backgrounds, where I don't know if I'm retouching black or brown, or if it's cool or warm, or really what's going on at all. Here with the skin, I can clearly see the color I need to mix, and I have plenty of area to reference. This is not to say that this goes quickly or it's easy easy, but it feels easier, if that makes any sense. And by starting off with this, I hope to set myself on the right path, give myself an easy win and put some wind in my sails so that when I have to tackle the more challenging projects, I can remember that though it was hard, because I was meticulous, because I gave it time and patience, I was able to successfully address this area. And so if I can repeat that on the more challenging areas, well, I know that it will succeed because I've seen it before. Now, this time lapse of retouching on this arm that I'm going to do took about four hours in one sitting. And I chose to do it in one sitting because things were going well. I was listening to some great music, the sun was at my back, I felt good, and I didn't want to stop. Sometimes that's not the case, and sometimes things go terribly wrong and I have to walk away for an hour or a day or even a week. But when the wind is in your sails, when you have momentum, well, you want to capitalize on it. You want to ride that wave. And so I didn't think that I was going to spend nearly four hours retouching this section, but I did, and I'm glad that I did. Now, four hours may seem like a long time, <laughs> but, but by the end of this project, I will have over 40 hours into retouching this painting. That's not including all of the work to get to the retouching point. 40 hours. Five days, eight hours a day, sitting and retouching. Now, this, of course, is split up and spread out over multiple weeks because otherwise I would lose my mind and start to resent this painting and my job, and I would run to the hills screaming like a crazy person. But yeah, it is time-consuming. It is difficult. But there's no other way to do it. And so you put on your big boy pants, and you get to work.
Finally, with weeks of retouching completed, I am ready to take the painting for the final treatment, the application of the synthetic UV-stabilized fully reversible varnish. This step, the application of the varnish, is both extremely exciting and also nerve-wracking because I have so much time invested in this painting, and I am so invested in the result being perfect for my client. And when I apply this varnish, I will see if my color matching is truly accurate. I'll see if all of the structural treatments I've done have affected a positive change on that otherwise really textured surface. The application of the final varnish really does render a verdict on all of the work I've done thus far. And it's not that I can't remove it and start over or adjust something if I feel the need to, but I really, really don't want to have to. I want my work to be perfect on the first pass, if that's at all possible. 
And after applying the varnish, I'm going to brush it out. While the solvent evaporates and the resin becomes sticky, I can add a slight texture and give it an unbelievably beautiful finish. And after all of the work, the painting is now complete. This painting was always stunning. We knew that when it arrived at the studio. It was just hiding behind a litany of problems. The surface was highly textured, catching the light and making it impossible to actually see the image. The paint was actively flaking off of the canvas, and there had been losses and more to come. An old glue lining had failed, and the retouching that accompanied that lining had discolored and was now visible with the naked eye. The work required to bring this painting back to a state where we can enjoy it, we can see the image, we can see the beautiful brushwork, the delicate rendering of the colors and the skin tones, was not insignificant. Structural work was required to relax and flatten down that paint layer and stabilize it so that it didn't continue to deteriorate into the future. But seeing the surface now, well, actually not seeing the surface, it not catching a raking light and distracting us, is what it's all about. Completing the areas of losses and enabling us to see the image, not the damage, was critical in returning this painting to the state that the artist originally intended it to be. And throughout all of this, while the work was maybe not as challenging as some of the others that I have worked on, it was difficult. It was slow. It was costly in terms of time, emotional, mental, and yes, physical capital. But the results are worth it, because when we see this painting and get lost in its storytelling, in the mastery of the artist and the execution, well, we can allow it to affect us, trigger an emotion, make us feel something, and really, isn't that what art is all about? I joked that when this painting came in, my cup would runneth over with the amount of conservation work required, specifically all of the retouching, the 40 plus hours of retouching. And it did not disappoint. Just like Bacchus, my cup did runneth over. And while it was an incredibly rewarding experience, transforming this painting from a state of dilapidation to glory, well, I'm ready for one of those easy paintings now. <laughs>